Hello, I'm Victor Strandberg, concluding our studies in the poetry of T.S. Eliot. In this session, we're going to look at Ash Wednesday, Eliot's first major poem uh, after his conversion. Ash Wednesday in the Christian calendar is a day of repentance and humility. And for T.S. Eliot, humility was the supreme virtue necessary to become a Christian. He said in one of his essays on Shakespeare that humility is the hardest virtue to achieve. Nothing dies harder than the desire to think well of oneself. On the other hand, he also said in Four Quartets, much later, that humility is the only wisdom. And it was his final answer to the crisis of belief. Now, by the same token, pride, the seventh and deadliest sin in the medieval tradition, was T.S. Eliot's particular obstacle to the Christian conversion. In order to become a Christian, Eliot, in particular, had to renounce three forms of pride. The first that I would cite is pride of intellect, which is to say that Eliot, because of his intellect, his studies in modern science, in secular thinking, in the naturalistic philosophy of life, because of all that, he ended up as a hollow man living in the wasteland. He would have to renounce his intellect in order to become a Christian. I'm going to come that, back to that in a moment, but let's move to the second mode of pride that he would have to renounce to become a Christian. This would be social pride. During the wasteland period, Eliot had taken consolation from his superiority to the low-class rabble that show up in his poems the Sweeney's, the Bleisteins, uh, the Rachel Rabinoviches, the Poles and Greeks, and other such. Eliot, of course, knew that this was a false value, and giving up that form of pride would not be too difficult, although, uh, living in England, T.S. Eliot did, I think, retain some satisfaction about his place in the social hierarchy. Perhaps there was a little too much to ask him to extirpate all of his sense of social superiority. But we'll have to say that he tried and that he never treated his social inferiors with the contempt that he had shown during the earlier phase of his, of his life and poetry. In fact, he tried to make amends to Sweeney in particular by writing a sort of tragic take on Sweeney. He called it Sweeney Agonistes, sort of like Milton, Milton's poem. Um, and um, though this play was not in the end completed, nonetheless, he did try to turn a Christian eye to the object of previous contempt, Sweeney. The third and most difficult form of, poet, uh, of pride for T.S. Eliot to overcome was his pride as an artist. That was the one real consolation through the wasteland period, to be the king of poetry, uh, the acknowledged uh, leader of the poetic revolution of the 20th century in English, and to be honored and celebrated around the world for his poetic achievement. He would have to renounce that too, to become a Christian. Now I want to come back for a moment to Eliot's pride of intellect, the first of three, these three forms of pride that I cited as something he would have to renounce. Uh, in our Western civilization, we think of the mind as semi-autonomous. It goes wherever it pleases, we cannot really have full control of our thinking. There's something involuntary 
about the way the mind moves from one thought to another, from one subject to another, one memory to another, perhaps. And there's nothing we can do about it. Here, I think, T.S. Eliot's studies in Buddhism come into play. If we remember the fire sermon, the Buddha advised his monks to renounce the physical body, the five senses are on fire, and to renounce the mind, which is also on fire. If they could do that, suppress both the body and the mind, then they would have access to the deepest, truest, eternal self, the Atman, which thereupon would be free from the wheel of rebirth, and it could join permanently the universal soul, which Hindus call the Brahman, that is B-R-A-H-M-A-N, the eternal soul that pervades all of reality and that goes on forever. In Buddhism, one would lose one's conscious identity, one's separate self, in joining that universal soul. But the separate self, the conscious identity, was a burden and even a sin. And so we might say, to escape all that into nirvana was the greatest blessing in the Buddhist view of life. Now, Eliot turned away from these metaphysical features of Buddhism, nirvana, the universal soul, which the Atman joins, uh, at the time of one's death. But uh, he did retain the Buddhist set of ethics. He overcame the fires of the body when he was baptized and at the same time took a vow of celibacy. Uh, that's an odd thing for a married man, perhaps. Certainly nothing in either the Christian or Hebrew tradition would require that, but I think it was, you might say, that Buddhist heritage he turned to, to overcome his body. And I think in the same fashion, he overcame his mind, disciplined the mind through something akin to uh, the way the Buddhist holy man or Hindu holy man concentrates, closes out the world around him, fastens exclusively on access to the eternal, to the Atman, to that part of himself, uh, which may be obscured by the body and the mind if we cannot discard those distractions. Eliot's form, I think, or his parallel to this Buddhist function of spiritual discipline was his way of worship in the Anglican Church, which is to say he was extremely punctilious. Um, one of his, one of, um, his practices when he taught at Harvard in the early 1930s for a year or two was that he would show up every morning at the Anglican chapel near Harvard and a, uh, an acolyte, a student at Harvard who served with the priest in that Anglican church, remarked that every morning early, um, Eliot would show up frequently as the only parishioner to take part in the Anglican Eucharist, which our Catholics call the Mass, and would always be extremely careful to observe the form of worship exactly, smiting his breast at exactly the same time, falling, falling on his knees at exactly the right point in the liturgy, and so forth. And so I think he was able to, in the end, discipline his intellect sufficiently so that he could cast aside uh, the uh, powers of the mind that had led him into the wasteland, that had overridden his religious desires in poems like The Hollow Men, The Wasteland, and Gerontion. Now I want to turn to the poem proper at this point, and we'll take up section one. This section of Ash Wednesday recounts T.S. Eliot's psychological or spiritual death so that he could become a new man as a Christian. This is a section where he renounces his pride as an artist. 
The master metaphor of Ash Wednesday is of a man toiling up a spiral staircase, perhaps going up a tower, maybe even a church steeple. Now, a spiral is quite different from a wheel. When a wheel turns, we come back to where we started, meaningless repetitions. In a spiral, you begin at point A, and you end up quite differently at point B. And so, uh, as you turn to the Christian faith, this metaphor changes from the wheel to the spiral staircase to show a sense of spiritual progress being possible. Because I do not hope to turn again means that he will not go down the spiral staircase. He will never go back to the wasteland point of view, that spiritual desert. Because I do not hope, uh, presumably hope is too fragile a thing that he has to get beyond both hope and despair, as he says later in this poem, in order to toil up the staircase. What he really needs is faith, and he seems to have found that to keep him moving up that spiral direction. Now it's interesting, because I do not hope to turn, desiring this man's gift and that man's scope. That's a fascinating excerpt from Shakespeare. Uh, in one of his sonnets, Shakespeare, the greatest master of language who ever lived, expressed this envy of other artists. Desiring this man's gift and that man's scope, and uh, T.S. Eliot now renounces that artistic envy that even Shakespeare exhibited. I no longer strive to strive towards such things. He's given up his status as an artist. But notice in parentheses this marvelous little backlash. He can't help himself. In parentheses, why should the aged eagle stretch its wings? Now, by calling himself the eagle of modern poetry, the king of birds, it's quite clear that he has not quite suffocated his pride as an artist after all. Why should the aged eagle stretch its wings? Everyone knows what I can do. I've shown my stuff. I don't have to strut my talent anymore. Uh, there is that kind of an undertone even while he is struggling to achieve humility as an artist. We proceed with a similar sort of a backlash in the next two lines. Why should I mourn the vanished power of the usual rain? The rain. He was the king of poetry. Make no mistake about it. He wants everyone to know that he abdicated the throne voluntarily. He didn't have to do it. And he can even abdicate the throne with a sort of dismissal of its importance. The vanished power of the usual reign. It was no big deal being the king of poetry. The second stanza of part one, I think, takes us into the garden of the muses. Because I do not hope to know again the infirm glory of the positive hour, that was the one source of strength, of value, of spiritual achievement. Back in his wasteland period, the infirm glory of the positive hours when his creativity was at full sail. Because I do not think, and indeed he does have to renounce his intellect in order to give up his his role as an artist, uh, and of course, uh, simply in order to become a Christian believer. Because I do not think, because I know I shall not know the one veritable transitory power, that is the power of artistic creativity, which he is renouncing. Because I cannot drink, there where trees flower and springs flow, that's the Garden of the Muses, 
uh, which he is now departing. As we move on, certain themes that were of such tremendous importance in the past now lose their importance. One of them is the quest for the meaning of time. There will be time, there will be time. Back in Prufrock's case, hurry up, please, it's time in the wasteland. Now, as a Christian, time is reduced uh, under the perspective of eternity. Because I know that time is always time, merely time, uh, as a man now who, rela who, who rejects his own intellectual quest of the past, he can accept his limitations in not knowing the meaning of time. It doesn't matter. And place is always an only place. And what is actual is actual only for one time and only for one place. I rejoice that things are as they are. That's an astonishing statement for the author of The Wasteland. As you remember, Tiresias, uh, in the fire sermon, by the waters of Leman, I sat and wept. He certainly didn't rejoice back then. And he is still living in the wasteland, here in Ash Wednesday, in the natural world. But now he can rejoice that things are as they are because it is all subordinated to his Christian faith. I renounce the blessed face, he says, and renounce the voice. Now, I think what most makes sense here would be the voice and the face of the muses. Uh, that would be the context of the rest of part one. Because I cannot hope to turn again, consequently, I rejoice having to construct something upon which to rejoice. We go on with a prayer asking forgiveness, I think, for his past poetry. Poetry that served as a sort of Pied Piper's role, leading other people into the wasteland. But notice how, as he prays for forgiveness, he cannot resist using the royal we. When Queen Elizabeth heard a bad joke, excuse me, I meant to say Queen Victoria. When Queen Victoria heard a bad joke, she would say, we are not amused. And so here Eliot prays, I pray to God to have mercy upon us. And he prays for strength to stop thinking. I pray that I may forget these matters that with myself I too much discuss. So the Buddhist discipline helps in suppressing his mind, but he also needs to offer a Christian prayer for additional strength to achieve that purpose. Because I do not hope to turn again, this is a permanent conversion, I'm not going back. Let these words answer in Ash Wednesday. For what is done not to be done again, I will not write that kind of blasphemous poetry in the future. May the judgment not be too heavy upon us. We go back now to the earlier image of Eliot as the king of poetry and as the eagle, the aged eagle, no longer having to stretch its wings. Now at the end of part one, because these wings are no longer wings to fly, but merely vans to beat the air, the air which is now thoroughly small and dry, teach us to care and not to care. Now that line, I think, is the second contribution of Buddhism to this poem. The first being that Buddhist discipline to suppress both the mind and the body in order to become not a Buddhist, but a Christian in Eliot's case. And here, teach us to care and not to care, I think, is a Christian version of the Buddhist middle way. The idea here, I think, as in Buddhism, is that if we do not care at all about the world's sufferings, that is a sin. We think back to people like the young man assaulting the typist in the fire sermon, 
we think of Sweeney uh, exploiting the woman in Sweeney among the Nightingales. There are other Sweeney poems where that takes place. We think of the young man perhaps even um, abandoning the woman in Portrait of a Lady. These men did not care at all, and that is a sin. On the other hand, it is also a sin to care too much. To care too much leads to despair, to disbelief, to the anguish of Gerontion, I have no ghosts, to the anguish of Tiresias by the waters of Leman, I sat and wept, and obviously to the anguish of T.S. Eliot himself. So this then is a beautifully crafted response to the sufferings of the world. Uh, there's nothing by way of poetic pyrotechnics here. Uh, there's no flashy images, no particular um, notable sound effect, though certainly Ash Wednesday is full of beautiful sound effects, internal rhymes and the like. Nonetheless, this sentence is stripped down to its absolute essence. Teach us to care and not to care. That's what it means to be a Christian. Teach us to sit still. We end then for a supplication on behalf of us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Going to part two. Here, T.S. Eliot accepts his physical annihilation. In part one, he was a psychological or spiritual annihilation as a artist. He would have to give up on that uh, and assume a new identity altogether as a Christian artist uh, with people saying, this is all folly. Uh, he accepted all that. His physical annihilation is also easy to accept. We begin, I think, with a figure from Dante, Lady Three White Leopards Sat Under a Juniper Tree. Uh, in Dante's, in, uh, in his Divine Comedy, the very first thing that happens is Dante wakens in a dark wood halfway through his life, and he sees off in the distance the hill of salvation shining. He runs, he sprints at full tilt towards that hill of salvation. When he gets to the bottom, the path is blocked by three savage animals, a leopard, a lion, and a wolf. Those animals represent Dante's propensity to sin. And for that reason, he cannot go up the hill of salvation. He has to go by another way through hell and purgatory before he can climb that hill. Now, in Eliot's setting in part two, the three white leopards are in a cemetery. Uh, the juniper tree is an evergreen that is often found in cemeteries. And these animals have devoured Eliot's physical body. Uh, they sat under a juniper tree in the cool, cool of the day having fed the satiety on my legs, my heart, my liver, and that which had been contained in the hollow round of my skull. Now, the reason why Eliot's physical annihilation does not matter is because he has now found a myth of rebirth, which to Eliot is alive and vital and valid, and which he turns to uh, as the immediate next line. And God said, shall these bones live? Shall these bones live? This is a reference to the prophet Ezekiel in the Hebrew Bible, who had a vision of a valley full of dry bones. And as he watched, a voice said, God's voice, shall these bones live? And as Ezekiel watched, the bones came together as a full skeleton, and the skeletons put on flesh, and then they assumed life and stood up, fully alive. Uh, as we proceed in part two, uh, Eliot describes himself as here dissembled upon for hiding 
something, but also for being disassembled physically. I proffer my deeds to oblivion. Again, having attained to humility, he feels that nothing he did in life was really worthwhile. I proffer my deeds to oblivion, oblivion and my love to the posterity of the desert. His love also was sort of imperfect, and particularly now that he is a celibate man, he can renounce sexual love as something tainted and unworthy back in the wasteland. Um, let them whiteness of bones atone of forgetfulness. There's no life in them. As I am forgotten and would be forgotten, so I would forget. Uh, dealing, I suppose, with the agony he cited at the beginning of the wasteland. April is the cruelest month, mixing memory and desire. Here now, he is free of both in the graveyard. And God said, prophesy to the wind. This is what uh, he told Ezekiel in the episode I just mentioned. The bone sang chirping with the burden of the grasshopper saying, and here we proceed into the most lyrical section of part two, these very short lines, giving us a long list of Christian paradoxes. Now, another way to view these lines is through the prism of that great lesson of part one, teach us to care and not to care. That is, find the middle way through resolving these paradoxes, this listing of opposites. He addresses then the Lady of Silences, calm and distressed, torn and most whole, rose of memory and rose of forgetfulness, exhausted and life-giving, wearied, reposeful. The single rose, capital R, that would be the incarnation of Christ. That's why uh, we have rose windows in the great cathedrals of Europe to celebrate the Incarnation. The single rose is now the garden, capital G, the garden of Christian faith, where all loves end. Uh, the end of the endless journey to no end. That word end has a double meaning. One meaning, of course, is a final termination of something. But the other meaning is a sense of purpose, uh, as in the phrase, means and ends. In four quartets, a dozen years in the future, T.S. Eliot would use uh, that particular reference to ends as a central basis of the poem. Here then, the Christian faith, the garden, is the end of the otherwise endless journey to no end. We conclude part two about the physical annihilation of T.S. Eliot with Eliot's bones in the graveyard singing, happy to be dead. Under a juniper tree, the bones sang, scattered and shining. We are glad to be scattered. We did little good to each other back when Eliot was alive. Under a tree in the cool of the day with the blessing of sand, forgetting themselves and each other, united in the quiet of the desert. Eliot can't resist the pun on a cemetery lot in the next line. This is the land which she shall divide by lot. This is the land we have our inheritance. Being dead and being, as it were, grateful for the gift of death, you might say and escape from the wasteland to a better life, shall these bones live. The next two sections of Ash Wednesday give us two kinds of mysticism. That was the chapter in William James's Varieties of Religious Experience that Elias found of greatest interest. Uh, in Four Quartets, he cites the Greek philosopher a little before the time of Socrates, named Heraclitus, who declared that the way up 
and the way down are the same. They come out in the same place. In section three and four of Ash Wednesday, we have the way up, a direct vision of glory, and the way down through the dark night of the soul. They both come out in the same way. It's typical of Eliot, who liked to be comprehensive, to address both forms of mysticism. Here in part three, we take the way down through the dark night of the soul. Uh, now, the metaphor that is basic to the poem, climbing a spiral staircase, still holds as we begin part three. At the first turning of the second stair, I turned and saw below uh, the devil of the stairs, who wears the deceitful face of hope and despair. So he is toiling up the staircase, but he is going through darkness at this phase of the journey. And what happens next is he reaches a landing. Um, at the first turning of the third stair, and this landing represents the temptation to simply stay at this part of the wasteland, we'll call it, which represents the world's beauty. As an artist particularly, Eliot was susceptible to beauty in all its forms. And uh, for many artists, uh, this will suffice as a way to live a successful, perhaps even happy life, to relish uh, what the world can offer by the way of a transcendent experience of its beauty. Eliot himself had experienced this, listening to Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, or in the episode with the Hyacinth Girl. I could not speak. My heart failed. Uh, I, I was neither living nor dead looking to the heart of light the silence back then. So in this particular case, we have then a glimpse through a slotted window of something beautiful out there. At the first turning of the third stair was a slotted window bellied like the fig's fruit. And beyond the hawthorn thought blossom and the pasture scene, the broad backed figure dressed in blue and green enchanted the Maytime with an antique flute. Blown hair is sweet, brown hair over the mouth blown, lilac and brown hair. We remember some of these images early on. The enticements of the world's beauty. Now, of course, Eliot's pilgrim has to keep toiling up the staircase, cannot simply sit and enjoy the world's beauty as though this were the answer to the crisis of belief. Uh, something similar, as you remember, in Journey of the Magi. There were times we regretted the summer palaces on the slopes, the silken girls bringing sherbet. It would be so nice just to sit back and enjoy this. So Eliot calls all that a distraction. Music of the flute stops and steps of the mind over the third stair. Fading strength beyond hope and despair. I think that's the strength of faith, climbing the third stair. And with the close from the liturgy, Lord, I am not worthy. Lord, I am not worthy, but speak the word only, and my soul shall be saved, which he doesn't say here, but he implies. Section four gives us the way up, a direct vision of Christ. It's put in the form of an interrogative format. Who walked between the violet and the violet? Uh, that image of the violet comes in from time to time. The typist at the violet hour, about ready to close up and go home. Uh, it seems to be a particularly mysterious moment in the day in Eliot's treatment. Who walked between the violet and the violet? who walked between the various ranks of varied green, going in blue and white, excuse me, white and blue in Mary's color. Uh, people talking out there of trivial things in ignorance and in knowledge of eternal dolor. 
Who moved among the others as they walked? Who made strong the fountains and made fresh the springs? The wastelands of life made fertile. Made cool the dry rock, made firm the sand. Sylvania Vos. Uh, that's a line from Dante's Purgatory. And it's a line that means, remember us. Remember us sinners in purgatory, uh, in your time on earth, when you have time to think and decide about these sacred issues. He's speaking now about his life in the wasteland. I think the point is we have to live on both levels, even after his conversion. We do now have a spiritual dimension of existence that did not exist back in the wasteland period. Uh, there is a metaphysical answer to the burial of the dead. Eliot has climbed aboard that raft of salvation and enjoys it immensely. But we also, so long as we have physical life on this earth, must go on living on a naturalistic level too. And I think that's what he's describing. Here are the years that walk between, bearing away the fiddles and the flutes, um, and nonetheless offering, because of this new perspective, a way to redeem the time, time which was irredeemable. It meant simply the approach of old age and death in the earlier period of Eliot's naturalistic thinking. Here, however, he speaks of the New Year's walk, restoring the years, restoring with a new verse the ancient rhyme, certainly with Eliot's new verse dedicated to the propagation of the faith. Redeem the time. Redeem the unread vision in the higher dream. I think that's the Christian faith while jeweled unicorns draw by the gilded hearse. In my view, the gilded hearse is Eliot's previous poetry. And here, even though he's struggling to attain humility as an artist, he can help but note that by golly, that hearse really was quite an excellent bit of craftsmanship. A gilded hearse, being drawn by jeweled unicorns. A pretty nice spectacle, even as it's drawn off stage. We turn now to the lady, the intercessor, uh, a figure that probably, amongst others, represents Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus. The intercessor. Will the silent sister veiled in white and blue, that's Mary's color, um, Will she pray for us is the essential question. And as we end now, part four, a last view of this vision of glory. The fountain sprang up, the bird sang down, redeem the time, redeem the time. The token of the word unheard and unspoken. Till the wind shake a thousand whispers from the yew. The yew tree is another evergreen. It suggests a cemetery, but now with a sense of immortality attached to uh, the, uh, this, this, this landscape. The last line of part four, the way up, is after this our exile, which is to say the mystic vision eventually comes to an end and we have to return to ordinary reality our exile back to this ordinary world of time and matter and nature. A disappointing outcome, but one we have to accept so long as we live on physically. Part five of Ash Wednesday is a prayer for people who are still trapped in the wasteland. And here Eliot refers to his poetry with a small w, the word, now in the service of the word with a capital W, the word of God, and indeed the word is God, according to the Gospel of St. John. 
the word was with God and the word is God according to that gospel. So he has a play on that term word as we begin part five. If the lost word is lost, small w is his poetry. If the spent word is spent, and I think that's his earlier poetry, which is lost and spent as far as he's concerned. Still is the unspoken word, the poetry that is yet to write for the Christian faith. And the word unheard, the capital W, the word of God, which is unheard by too many people, and it's up to him now to amend that. And the light shone in darkness, and against the word, capital W, the unstilled world still whirled, the turn of the wheel of time, the turning world, to no purpose except through the Christian faith. Um, and here the Christian faith is described as what's at the center of the wheel, the still point at the center of the churning world. So the unstilled world still whirled about the center of the silent word. The silent word, of course, being a reproach to the poet who now needs to use his talent for this new purpose. We have a lament then on Eliot's part over the damage he's done to people through his earlier poetry. Oh, my people, what have I done unto thee? Uh, here again, the struggle for humility seems to be a bit difficult. Eliot, as though he has the voice of a great prophet here, the leader of the people spiritually, which in a number of ways he was, but it seems a little bit out of tune uh, in this um, effort to be humble. Where shall the word be found? Where will the world resound? Etc. Uh, and uh, we move on then to the empathy for people still trapped in a wasteland mentality and a supplication to this lady to intervene for them. Will the veiled sister pray for those who walk in darkness, those who chose thee and oppose thee, those who were torn on the horn between season and season, between hour and hour, those who wait in darkness. Will the veiled sister pray for children at the gate who will not go away and cannot pray? That's sort of like Eliot in the hollow man, lips that would form prayers, but they are prayers to hollow stone. Oh, my people, what have I done to thee once again? the prophet lamenting his false prophecies in the past. Will the veiled sister between the slender yew trees pray for those who offend her and are terrified and cannot surrender, cannot follow Eliot's path into the Church of England in his case or into some branch of the Christian communion? In the last desert between the last blue rocks, and the rocks are always a motif indicating the wasteland, the desert in the garden, the garden in the desert. There's the motif that represents life on both levels. As a Christian, we may enjoy a garden in the naturalistic desert, which in one level we have to continue uh, as our, uh, our environment for living. Uh, but we do have a garden in that desert, which did not exist previously. On the other hand, even as Christians living in the garden, sometimes there is a desert in the garden, a time of despair, a time perhaps even of unbelief, a time of suffering, uh, and uh, we have to simply try to live on both levels again, on both, in both the garden and the desert. Turning now to the last section of Ash Wednesday, section six, 
the theme here, I think, is that of Eliot's posture of waiting for the end. He changes the conjunction at the beginning of part six quite conspicuously. He started with because I shall not turn again. That is, this is a permanent conversion. Now he says, although I do not hope to turn again. Although I do not hope to turn. Now I think the purpose of that conjunction here is to indicate that he will not go back down that star staircase to a naturalistic view of life. But he does have another temptation, which he has to struggle against. And that temptation is to get out of the wasteland now. I don't want to go on living all the years that I must in this sense of duality, of living both in the wasteland physically and on this other level spiritually. So he goes on to describe this life in the wasteland, which on one level continues, wavering between the profit and the loss. Yes, that false value still matters on this level of existence. In this brief transit where the dreams crossed, I think the dreams would represent the dimensions of time, past, present, and the future, which are dream-like given that no one has ever defined time successfully, no scientist, no theologian. Uh, all we know is that it is dream-like. He speaks then of the dream-crossed twilight between birth and dying. That's our life in this natural world. Now, his imagery of escape from it, I think, comes in two uses of metaphor. Bless me, Father, though I do not wish to wish these things. He cannot man maintain total mental discipline as a Christian. And so he has the image here of a ship leaving the wasteland. From the wide window toward the granite shore, the white sail still fly seaward, seaward flying. He would sort of like to go with that ship. The next image, unbroken wings, is of a bird flying away. And he would rather like to get out of this uh, environment now. The lost heart stiffens and rejoices in the lost lilac and the lost sea voices. The weak spirit quickens to rebel. Um, he goes on now further describing life in the wasteland on this level that he has to go on experiencing. This is the time of tension between dying and birth. Well, yes, between dying uh, as he grows older and the new birth that he's looking forward to. This is the place of solitude solitude. There is still a sense of loneliness. Now, he overcame his loneliness very largely by joining the Christian communion, that vast uh, organization, we could call it, though it's more than that, that vast network or web of believers, uh, which he could now feel solidarity with. Even so, in the natural world, perhaps, there remains an experience of solitude. This place of solitude with three dreams crossed past, present, and the future between blue rocks. Yes, the rocks are the wasteland. But when the voices shaken from the yew tree drift away, let the other you be shaken and reply. And the other you, I think, would be the voices from the next world, the voices be speaking immortality, Maybe the same voices that we saw or heard in the hollow men, voices in the winds singing, more distant and more solemn than a fading star. I think those voices are more clear and more real to him now. Blessed Sister, Holy Mother, Spirit of the Fountain, Spirit of the Garden, we sum up now the lessons of Ash Wednesday. Suffer us not to mock ourselves with falsehood. 
teach us to care and not to care, teach us to sit still, to be accepting, even among these rocks in that is living in the wasteland, our peace in his will, subordinating his own intellect, his own appetites, his entire being to his will, capital H. Sister, mother, spirit of the river, spirit of the sea, suffer me not to be separated from God, uh, uh, perhaps separated in other respects also, uh, as he has joined the Christian communion. We conclude then with a notable prayer, let my cry come unto the capital T. Previously, this expression of religious desire was suppressed uh, when he thought of an infinitely gentle, infinitely suffering thing. He wiped it away with a scornful laugh in preludes. Or in the hollow men, this is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper, a contemptuous description of his own desire, his supplication of a dead man's hand under the twinkle of a fading star. Now he can openly and honestly offer that same version of religious desire uh, without any sense of embarrassment. Let it stand as his last word in our study of T.S. Eliot's poetry. Now to conclude, I have tried to render a sort of bare bones analysis of T.S. Eliot's poetry. I think that if you followed the argument thus far, that you do understand T.S. Eliot fundamentally. There is of course a great deal more to learn uh, many shelves of books have been written about the term naturalism. Many shelves likewise on the term modernism. Uh, many shelves about T.S. Eliot's multitude of references to other literatures in the past, uh, to his thinking in so many subtle ways. And I leave all that to those in my listening audience who may wish to pursue further interest in T.S. Eliot. Uh, now, as I close, I will uh, mention one other enterprise that I'm going to append uh, to this work I've been doing. Uh, in a short time, a week or 10 days, I'm going to render one or two more lectures on T.S. Eliot's literary and cultural criticism, uh, which were also of great importance uh, to the literary culture of his own time, and even now passing on to our time. We'll end our discussion there. <clears throat>